Hello, we've got a bumper show in store with six Barclays Women's Super League matches to bring you this evening. And as it was Women's Football Weekend, there are some huge games and fierce rivalries to be contested. Here's what's coming up. Our first destination is Manchester for the derby at the Etihad Stadium. As City hopes to do the double over United for the first time in their history. Title contenders Chelsea took the short trip across London as they look to continue their 100% away record against West Ham. And Arsenal needed to get back to winning form if they were to salvage their title dreams. They travelled to Aston Villa. Plus, we'll have the best from the rest of the matches in the WSL. And to match the quality on the pitch, we've got quality in the studio as well. Ready to give their expert analysis, I'm joined by Anita Sante and Fern Whelan. Evening both, we're back with you shortly. But of course, we're going to start the show at the Etihad for the Manchester Derby. City claimed the bragging rights at Old Trafford earlier in the season with a 3-1 victory but they have never done the double over their neighbours in a single season. Watching on to see if the Blues could make history and continue their push for the WSL title were Siobhan Chamberlain and Robin Cowan. Manchester City make one change from the 4-1 win over Brighton. A late one, Laya Alexandri pulled out of the warm-up, so Alana Kennedy starts for the first time since December. Mary Fowler starts back-to-back -back WSL games for the first time this season after scoring and providing an assist last weekend. Chloe Kelly is once again named on the bench. Khadija Bunnyshaw is one goal away from becoming Manchester City's all-time top scorer. The Manchester United side chose one change from their 2-0 victory over Bristol City. Jay-Z returns to the starting 11 for the first time after being away at the Gold Cup with Brazil. She replaces Melvin Mallard. Lisa Nelson keeps her place after scoring both goals last time out. Nikita Paris, formerly of Manchester City, is United's top scorer with 16 goals in all competitions this season. She has yet to net against her former side in previous seven WSL appearances. And it's a very happy birthday to Mark Skinner, 41 today. A father for the second time as well to a, a baby girl. A big signing in the summer, Jay-Z from Barcelona. Just the one WSL goal so far. You can see she can really light up a game when she's in the mood. The Pouts of Tadmor end product. She's got the skills. You can see them now. Trying to burst forward. Here's Paris. First real opportunity of this Manchester derby. It's a brilliant stop by Keating, and those are the exact skills that you're talking about from Jay-Z. And it's a strong, firm strike from the Keita Paris at that near post. And Keating makes the save. Blondell went for it and scored nicely for Kasparai. And actually, Abigail Byrne wasn't happy with that challenge from Blundell. Really not happy. A yellow card for Hannah Blundell. You see her frustration from that. It was high. It didn't look as venomous at the time, but when you see the angle back, it was a high foot. Kasparai. Trying to find short. Well, it's not the best of passes from Garcia. Hannah Blundell made the challenge. The referee didn't think that was even a foul, and it's a goal kick. And Hannah Blundell, who's just been booked, might have just got away with a big one here. Hasegawa takes that down under very little pressure. Coombs. Now Hemp, will have on the overlap. Delivers behind Shaw, and it's there! Chips Park! Her first ever league goal for Manchester City! It's come at the Etihad in the derby! The stuff of dreams! United were forced to go long there. They played out short so many times. But here we can see Bunny Shaw in an offside position. Millie Turner called it, it's not been given. And it's played across, down the left-hand side. And as it's whipped in there, 
Three Manchester City players unmarked inside the box. And it's Park that finishes it. This will Abby with the assist. Kasparai. Fowler. That's a corner kick. Manchester City are really doing a good job of playing through central areas in this last 10 minutes or so. They started off by forcing them out wide. Now they're going a lot more central and they're finding a lot more joy from it. Here's Fowler. Space for Hasegawa. Oh, it's Park again! On track! Jess Park puts Manchester City two goals to the goal. So well worked, and it's the delivery from Hasegawa, and she reacts first, off the back shoulder of Maya Letizia, doesn't see her coming, and like the first goal, volleyed in with cool, calm composure. An afternoon to remember for Jess Park. Oh, Serena Wiegmann. Well... What a moment to score your first WSL goals for your club, Jess Park. A lovely skill from JC. Oh, Park, too strong for Zellum. Seconds on the clock after the restart. And surely Manchester City have won it now. What a start. And Khadija Shaw with that goal becomes Manchester City's record goal scorer. It's three and it's sure that's the goal scorer. But for me, it's here. It's Jess Park. The strength she shows against Zellan. And the reverse ball there. Bunny Shaw, the composure to take the touch, open up her body and curl it past Mary Urchin into the back of the net. A brilliant finish. Blondell keeps it going. Mannion. Blondell. Oh, it's it. Big deflection. And Manchester United have a little bit of hope. Hannah Blundell is in the right place. She's there ready to pick up any kind of second ball. Gets round the outside, delivers it in. And it's the outstretched foot of Kasparai that deflects past Kiara Keating and into this near post. Full time. And the Derby Day honours go for Manchester City. A coming-of-age performance from Jess Park. Two goals and an assist. But a controlled, confident, purposeful performance from Manchester City. Full-time at the Etihad. Manchester City 3, Manchester United 1. I don't think there's a feeling that compares to it. You know, I've been working really hard and that was just the final bit that I wanted and today I managed to get that. I'm not even thinking about goal difference to be honest, I'm thinking about winning the next game in front of us and you know this is a, this is a big game today, obviously it's a big derby, there's big rivalry there and we've come out on the right side this season. I think the first goal is offside, that's when it starts. Um, I felt we had control of the game up until that point, Manchester City had a very limited chance, I think it was a shot from Jess Park from distance. Um, we've had good chances in the down their end, and I think when I look back and Bunny in their build-up is offside, and she comes back onside, that's huge. It's too big in these in these games to um, to let it go. Yes, that's a huge win for Manchester City, isn't it? And one player who enjoyed it particularly was Kirsten Casper. I take a look at this on Instagram. Blew away the Reds once more this season. It's called the City of Manchester for a reason.
P.S. Quite an occasion for my first goal. What she doesn't mention there is, of course, it was an own goal. But look, for a great win for Manchester City. The scoreline suggests that they really dominated Manchester United. But was, does that reflect the game? I think for me, they were the more clinical side, for sure. Um, I think the first 20 minutes, I'd actually say Man United were pretty much all over City. I think they did really well to, in the way they pressed. They stopped the ball getting to Hasegawa, which is obviously how we know City like to play through the thirds. Um, and they had a, a really good chance in Nikita Paris. So they actually had created some good chances, but City went on and won it because they were the more clinical side for me. Anita, it was a wonderful afternoon for Jess Park. She's probably one of the players who's making the most of that whole left by Jill Rawdon and her injury. You work with Jess at England under 23s. It was watched on by Serena Wiegemann today. You imagine Wiegemann would be taking a few notes on Jess Park, don't you? Yeah, I think she'll be really impressed with her contributions today. Obviously, she's been with the recent England squad as well. But, you know, this, is, this goal starts from an offside um, situation. Bunny Shaw is in offside position, gets herself back into play in the first phase and, and, and the combination begins. But just watch Jess Park's movement, you know, she just is so patient to just wait, hang out there, make sure she has space and time and just guide that ball into the back of the net. It's, it's a beautifully worked goal and the quality of the ball into the box as well, but just the composure. And again, she's involved in the second goal. She actually starts the short corner, a wonderful in-swinger from Hasegawa. She ghosts off the back shoulder of Hannah Blundell and in behind blind side of Maya Letizia. And it's just a composure to just tap that into the back of the net. You know, she's just showing that she can add goals to her game. And she got two goals for City back at her, you know, her club after a loan spell, obviously, with Everton. Yeah, and to do it at the Etihad as well. What an afternoon for Jess Park. Someone else who was also on the score sheet, of course, was Bunny Shaw. She's now become City's all-time leading goal scorer, Fern. You're a big fan, aren't you? I am. For me, she's absolutely phenomenal. And it's not just, you know, the goals, yes. She's their all-time leading goal scorer now, but it's the work rate she has off the ball and also, I mean, the clinicalness in front of goal. But we see here the strength, you know, she, she follows in and you can see Maya Letizia, she's just she ghost off her, ghost in between the two centre-halves centre and she puts it in the back of the net. And, yeah, for me, I think she deserves it. That first touch, she keeps it close to her body. The strength she's got, the power she's got, and also the work she does off the pitch. We heard her talk about it in her press conference at the end. She, you know, the video analysis. She does a lot of work off the pitch to make herself better, and that's why we can see she's growing and she's learning with every game. And for me, she's absolutely phenomenal. Well, look, United did pull one back. Hannah, Bl Hannah Blundell was largely involved with it. But the question was, should she have been on the pitch at that point? Because she picked up a yellow card early on in the game. Should she have had a had second one, Anita? Well, I think in the first uh, foul situation, for me, I don't think it was a yellow card. I think she went for a 50-50 ball. She's already on the ground as she goes to make that challenge. And maybe her foot comes up slightly. Um, not enough, really, for me to be warranted as a caution. But the second one, definitely, as Bunny Shaw gets away from her here, she just gets wrong side and, and leaves her foot in. And it catches Bunny Shaw on her left, her left foot and brings her down. And, and I think the question really is, if the first is a yellow, how can the second one not be? And therefore, Hannah Blundell, uh, you know, not, uh, not continue to be on the pitch. OK, so if you just yeah. the yellow cards were the wrong way round. The wrong way. <laughs> yeah, essentially. <laughs> they got there in the end, perhaps. <laughs> well, look, now to London for City's biggest title challengers, Chelsea. Emma Hayes aside, put three past Ajax in the first leg of their Champions League quarter-final midweek. They travelled to West Ham, having won 10 of their 11 meetings with the Hammers. Ben Andrews was on commentary duty for us today. Chelsea are in for everything. Their schedule is relentless. West Ham's less so. And there are a couple of changes in selection here. Anouk Denton returns, but at wing-back, Sissoko messes out. Shimizu moves in field. Further forward, Jess Ziu replaces Emma Snurler. Chelsea bring in Lawrence at right back, Chakovic to midfield and Beaver Jones up top. Out go Perisic, Cuthbert and Wrighton. And they're joined on that stellar bench by the fit again pair of Bjorn and Ramirez. Only six games to go for these two. West Ham's ambition here to get further clear of the relegation spot. Chelsea's. Well, as lofty as ambition can be. They want the lot. Only defending for them to do here. What a great cross from Awaki into Viviana Sey. Bursting to get into that box and got something on it. Just not quite enough. Great ball in. That's a good chance. 
At 20 seconds in. Scored the opener at Chelsea in the FA Cup. Meanwhile, at the other end, here's Lauren James. For Aggie Beaver-Jones. That's what champions do. Little wake-up call at one end. And a rapier-like counter-attack goal at the other. Got to take your chances against the big guns, so they'll come firing. And Aggie Beaver-Jones has put the champions in front here. Just like that. Barely a minute on the clock. The run went from outside to in. A perfect blind pass from Lauren James. She knew Beaver Jones was making that run. It's a brilliant goal. Make that eight goals this season for Aggie Beaver Jones and two of them against West Ham now. He's got it. Zhu. Trying to cause Ash Lawrence a problem. And here is Zhu. And she's goal side. What a chance! You just can't miss those, and Kirsty Smith has. Well, five minutes in here, West Ham could easily have scored twice, and they're losing. An extraordinary start to this match. That's nicely worked. Beaver Jones is on her way again. How's the touch here? It was brilliant, the control. The third touch, however, just took it close enough to bring Mackenzie Arnold into the equation. Otherwise, you're making a favourite for 2-0, I think. West Ham have done a lot of things really well in this opening 13 minutes, except the finishing. Here's a chance, though. There's the equaliser. And it's not going to count. He actually was there. They've done a lot of things well. That whole counter was started by her on the other side, kept on going. Oh, and she's on. Unquestionably onside. Oh, it's a big call, and I'm afraid it's the wrong one. Played on by Ash Lawrence, that should be 1-1. One, one. And West Ham are going to be spewing when they see that one later. Now, Wakey. As I say, with her, has gone the other way and has gone for goal. And what an effort that was. I think Hannah Hampton had decent eyes on it. Off the top of the park. That is super ambitious. Didn't look like the obvious path to take. I think Hampton's left that, you know. Now, I say, a great chance for Viviana Say. At the beginning and the end of this first half, you can't keep passing them up, and West Ham have. Chelsea have won all of the last 25 WSL games when they've led at half-time. A scary number if you're a West Ham fan. Teaser of a pass and a good one from Lawrence to Ramirez. And Kenarud... They're queuing up in the middle. And the challenge from Shimizu, so important there to stop it. But there is a perfect glimpse of what she can do. As yet, West Ham unable to add to their rather lowly-looking 17-league goal tally in this game number 17. Meanwhile, going the other way, this is Macario for Chelsea. And Ramirez... It's off the post. It crept so slowly there. Delicate. Little stab. Arnold was beaten. And we all had to wait for the spin of the ball. They're still in it. And they deserve to be West Ham. Bowman London charging forward and emerging with the football here. Buchanan got the challenge in as Uwaki draws one from Lupoltz. Lupoltz gets the yellow card. That sheer desire, that from Bergman Lundin, that's the kind of competitive spirit you need. Making something out of nothing.
Will it be third time lucky for Viviana Say? Oh, it might. It very nearly was. Closer with that one than with the two far more straightforward chances that came before. It's opened up for Kirby here. Ramirez, safety first from Tiziak, Chelsea corner. And again, it's Makaria going deep. This time, Cuthbert was round the back, and she has roofed it. That settles it for sure. Thumping finish from Erin Cuthbert. Through the crowd, you don't save those. Chelsea back on top for sure now. Great composure to keep it down. What a smack that is. That's relief as much as it is pleasure for Emma Hayes. She knows this game could easily have gone a different way. And they are back on top, Chelsea, by a couple of goals of goal difference. Resuming their customary position, looking down on the rest. No doubt that yet again, they were seriously troubled by an impressive West Ham underdog display here. But it is the champions who come away with the points. And yet another clean sheet, by the way. West Ham nil, Chelsea two. At the time when we scored the goal, which was more than a metre on side, we obviously, we're going in a completely different landscape. Last week, there was two goals that were scored against us, neither of which should have stood, which is another point draw for us. Tottenham game, we get an apology after the game for a goal that should never have stood for offside. I'm getting a bit sick of it, to be honest. But we were fortunate to be 1-0 up at half-time. You know, our defending out of possession, I think we struggled. Um, didn't take responsibility in the right moments. So I changed something at half-time and I thought second half much better from the team as a whole, but also the freshness from the bench. For me, that was the key difference. Yeah, some very strong words from Rianne Skinner there. And we will come on to that in a moment, but essentially a great afternoon for Chelsea. They were tested, but like we see so often, they found a way to win Fern. And it all started off with a rather wonderful team goal. Yeah, they always do seem to find a way, don't they? I think... This sums the Chelsea way up a little bit. And when you've got a goalkeeper like Hannah Hampton who can deliver balls on a sixpence like that out to Neve Charles, then obviously you're starting off well. Ball comes into Nuskin, and that's a fantastic through ball into the feet of Lauren James, who then just slides in Aggie Beaver Jones. What a fantastic team goal this is. And the reason it's so good is because everything is done off one and two touches. We see here Nuskin gets a head up. The run on the outside takes the player away. Lauren James knows exactly where Beaver Jones is going to be and then she pulls the trigger with a fantastic finish and no one can get anywhere near her. But I think West Ham will go away and have a look at it in terms of the defensiveness and, you know, can they get a little bit tighter to the Chelsea players? But because they played it so quickly, it was really difficult for them to do that. Not many teams score against Chelsea, so how gut-wrenching is it for West Ham to have had the ball in the back of the net, it then be disallowed for offside and the replay show it shouldn't have been? Yeah, and it wasn't even the first chance that they had against this Chelsea side. They did well to create some very good chances and you see she puts the ball in the back of the net here, Hayashi, and we'll see here in the replay, it's really disappointing again that we're talking about the officiating, unfortunately. Ball drops down to Hayashi, you can see a clear metre of space there, she's onside and she does really well that as the ball drops down to her, she's so composed in her finish and she managed to do that and not many teams, as you say, score past Chelsea, which she's managed to do. Anita, that goal is one thing, being disallowed wrongly, but the fact that West Ham had so many chances that they missed is another thing altogether, isn't it? Yeah, I think, you know, West Ham should take a lot of heart from the performance because not many teams breached Chelsea as many times as they did uh, this afternoon. You know, the right-hand side, they were causing all sorts of problems with their overload and it's overlapping runs to find cutbacks and really Kirsty Smith will be kicking herself for not putting that chance away. Again, Ueki caused all sorts of problems, carrying and dribbling the ball against the Chelsea defence. It's really unfortunate to just clip the crossbar. Um, Chelsea didn't know how to defend this overload on the right-hand side. They, you know, they were disjointed and they were able to exploit this space. And again, Asayi gets into a wonderful position, doesn't get bullied. It's just 
doesn't lacks the you know clinical composure to finish. Yes, and then Erin Cuthbert sealed it all with a rather classy finish, finish for Chelsea, didn't she? Yeah, I mean it was incredible delivery from Macario, outswinger corner into the box, and her ability to just chest down the ball and just rifle it back into the net. You know, Mackenzie Arnold, you're going to see her reaction as that ball hits the back of the net. Her head just goes down. She knows she has absolutely no chance of making a save on, on that shot and it's just pure class from Erin Cuthbert. Well look, two out of three of us in the studio have League Cup winners medals and I'll give you a clue, I'm not one of them. <laughs> Next weekend, Chelsea take on Arsenal, Easter Sunday. From the form you've seen of Chelsea today, is this finally the year, they've lost the last two, reminder, that Chelsea get their hands on the trophy? I think it could be. I think Chelsea have a lot of momentum going for them. They've had a lot of games and I think that gives them a good rhythm. Um, you know, they're a team that didn't perform at their best today, but they show that even when they're not at their best, they can deliver. They've got multiple players that can come in and have impact. Don't you think, Finn? Yeah, and I think, as you say, even though they're not performing, they're scoring goals and they're clinical, whereas maybe with Arsenal, we're not seeing that so much yeah. at the moment. So I think Chelsea might just edge it on the day. Yes, and just a reminder that the League Cup final is on the BBC on Easter Sunday. Now, though, to Villa Park as Arsenal aim to get one step closer to cementing a Champions League spot for next season after their title dreams were, of course, dented by Chelsea last weekend. Kickoff was delayed for a second week in a row, and no, this time nothing to do with socks. This time it was problems with travel. Well, Mark Scott watched on as the Gunners took on Aston Villa. Patton, Nobbs, and again. Adriana Leon's found a bit of space here. Salmon! She's done it again! Ebony Salmon with a fine finish to fire Villa into the lead. Scored in the success away at Everton last weekend and has found the net against Arsenal this evening. Leon's onside, Arsenal switched off, perfect pass from her, and it was an excellent finish. And with their first serious effort on goal this evening, Salmon has put Villa in front. Well, it's a far cry from the most recent meeting between the sides, Arsenal's 4-0 thumping in the League Cup semi-final earlier on this month. Here's Russo, though, good save. But the rebound is buried beautifully by Victoria Pelova. And Arsenal are level. It's a sickener for Villa to give the ball away so cheaply. Nobbs caught in possession, it spanned the way of Russo. Her effort beaten clear. But that is terrific technique from Victoria Pelova to steady herself and then get the shy at goal, inch perfect. Mead. Mead lays it off, Leonard Samano. Oh! The Norwegian within inches of putting Arsenal in front. And I don't think Russo was too far away on the follow-up either. Annalik was getting nowhere near that effort from Frida Leonard and Marnham. Given away by Leet. And that's a lovely pass. Oh, Leet makes amends with a terrific stop to keep out Caitlin Ford. First time hit was crisp from Ford but Leap flung herself in the way. Good try and a good save. Really cute effort from Pelova there. Well, she's already scored one with a very accurate strike. This wasn't too shabby either. On the half volley, it's heading in. That's a really good ball in! And how on earth has Black Stenius not been able to guide that home? Such a tempting delivery from Alessia Russo. Absolutely begging to be nodded home. Little. Neat from Mead. 
Fox. Good ball, and Russo off the bar. Blackstenius. And Villa survive again. Well, Villa's goal, certainly living a charmed life. Russo seemed to just get a neck on that. Almost enough to do the job, though. Blackstenius couldn't quite get the touch. Cooney Cross likewise. Had to wear as far as Fox. Russo lifted in nicely. And the header this time is in! Lotta Woman Moy. And to say that that has been coming would be a massive understatement. Finally, Villa's luck runs out. And Arsenal, just as they did earlier on this season, have come from a goal down to lead Aston Villa. And as well as ensuring that they don't lose any more ground on the top two, will also be a bit of a confidence boost there ahead of the cup final next weekend. They could be in for another here. Blackstenius has lost her footing and then got up and scored. Well, Villa are convinced that there should have been a handball. The whistle didn't come. Blackstenius gets the goal, and Jonas Eideval can celebrate success now at Villa Park. Well, Blackstenius played to the whistle. She didn't stop. The Villa players did. There's a suggestion of offside against Blackstenius anyway in the first place. That wasn't given, but the real thing Villa were furious about was the fact that it came off her arm when she got back off the turf. Clear contact with the arm, Villa stopped, Laxtenius didn't, and that's game over. I think first half was a decent first half from us. I think we were the far the better team, but we concede a goal on their only chance in it. And that, of course, makes it a challenging second half for us. But the way the team responded to do that and to keep on suffocating Villa, to keep on piling on pressure, to keep on creating chances, I thought that was great. It was important that we stuck together and um, dug in tonight. And we've done that because we've had to ride a few waves, um, a number of waves uh, tonight. But I thought we did that really well. So it's, um, yeah, it's frustrating to come away uh, having conceded two late goals. Well, Anita, two of your former sides, Arsenal got there in the end, but it was Aston Villa who opened the scoring. The big question is, though, is where were the Arsenal defence? Yeah, you, you'll see that Villa were the ones that took the game to Arsenal. Jordan Nobbs picks up the ball, has great vision to find Adriana Leon, who just finds that cut back in the box, and Ebony Salmon with a very composed finish. You see Leon on the back shoulder, just drifts slightly, gives herself half a yard, and Lotta Wibbermoy has to track that run because if she tracks that run, Leah Williamson can then deal with Ebony Salmon. And you can see that they just switched off, had a lapse of concentration and just weren't able to, to deal with that situation. Fern, so far this season, Villa have led in 11 games and have gone on to lose five of them. And it was the same story today. Arsenal then went to have lots of chances and eventually it was Victoria Pulova who pulled them level. Yeah, they did. They were piling on the pressure, Arsenal. It was only really a matter of time, and it came actually from Villa trying to play out. Jordan Nobbs dispossessed by Chloe de Cast. Russo latches onto it, and you know she does a great strike at goal. It comes back, and then Victoria Pulova is first to react. But you can see here is the press from Arsenal just to dispossess Nobbs, and then they can really latch onto it. The centre halves are split. Great strike. Can Anna maybe parry it a little bit further away from her goal and wider? Um, but it's a great finish from. Victoria Pulova. Well then Lotta Wibber Moy gives Arsenal the lead but it's Arsenal's third goal on Eater that's probably going to be the one that's most talked about and not for the best reasons because we're talking about refereeing again aren't we? Yeah and it's just disappointing that we're still talking about officiating you know th these decisions because they're costly and Blackstenius enters the box she tries to chop left then right and then slips but as she slips you know firstly she's offside you're going to see that you know, the discipline of this Aston Villa back line to hold that line, play her offside. Lino does, flag doesn't go up, play continues. Every defender is trying to recover. In this instance, um, Causey is trying to get a challenge um, and then she's able to score, but it's a handball. As the ball, you know, lands under her arm, her left arm clearly makes contact. Causey has got her arm up, 
you know, he's trying to get the attention of the referees. And, you know, I guess the only thing that I can say in terms of Aston Villa and maybe is that they should have just kept playing to the whistle and sort of put their arms up and trying to contest that decision. Yes, a few questions will be asked, won't they? Well, look, now it's time to round up the remaining fixtures, starting with relegation battlers Bristol City. And ahead of their match against Spurs, we caught up with the youngest manager in the Women's Super League. I'm really proud to work for Bristol City. Esther said no, and if you argue with her, you don't get a cake. I love working with young players. Nice, Lisa! Making sure that a young girl in the city feels inspired by just doing something in football, I, I think is success. Let's go! My management style, I would say, I like to see the positive things first, do different things every day as well. But ultimately, I like to lead and hope that people around me enjoy what they do and like I do. Hello, good morning. All right. Here she is. The pathway for female coaches can be a tough one. I've just completed my pro licence and there was 19 males to me, but I found it a really encouraging group of people and I hope to see that there are more females get into these positions. I think it's because of the, the tide is changing and the ratio should, should change with it eventually. Let's go. Go on, Tile. Yes. Go on, go on, Seg. Turned away. Ah, yes. Good cover, Meg. Well done. For me as a coach, I've learned loads. Yes. The challenges that, that come in front of us when you haven't got that player that does this for you, that's our style. OK, we have to do X. That's the bit of coaching that I absolutely love. You know, you have to change things in the moment. You have to take on all of this information and emotion and try and find a route and clarity through. There's so many answers to the questions and you've got to choose one and live and die by it. We've had a really tough season and that's, you know, you don't just have to look at results to, to figure that bit out. Whatever happens at the end of the season, hopefully we stay up. Uh, if we don't, we want to get back up, play at the highest level, develop players from within our pathway, from the southwest, from Bristol, um, and make sure that there's an opportunity for them to play first team football, along with inspiring the community around us. We have to look at it that way and that's that positivity again. We're in a privileged position, we've got pressure because everybody wants to be in our shoes. Bristol City were without a win in four Barclays WSL meetings with Tottenham and found themselves behind inside two minutes on Sunday. Beth England with her first league goal of the season. The home fans may have feared the worst after that early setback, but it wasn't until the half-hour mark that Spurs launched their next significant attack, Celine Bizet shooting wide from England's cross. Shortly after the restart, Drew Spence had an excellent opportunity to make it two, but her effort drifted wide of the post. Spurs continued to press but were unable to break down a resilient Bristol City. Wang Chuang went close, but her header hit the post. Matilda Vinberry also hit the woodwork in stoppage time for the visitors, who were unable to add to their goal tally. The main thing, though, when you only have one nil, is always that long ball from them or, or a counter-attack, and then they can do 1-1, and I think they, they defended well, but we also have, like, 19 chances, and we should score more goals today. But I'm, I'm, I'm happy with the team because they play very good football. After losing their first Barclays WSL match against Brighton in 2021, Leicester had since gone unbeaten in their four league meetings with the Seagulls. The first half may have been dominated by the visitors, but it was the Foxes who broke the deadlock in the 54th minute when Yuta Rantala connected with Yuka Momiki's pass. Moments later, however, Brighton grabbed a deserved equaliser when Leicester failed to clear a corner and the ball bounced in off substitute Madison Haley. The Seagulls took the lead for the first time in the match when Julia Zigiotti's hopeful ball found Katie Robinson, who rounded the on-rushing Lisa Kopp before finding the empty net. Leicester continued to press and with six minutes remaining made it two all when a finely weighted pass found Lena Peterman's composed finish. But just 60 seconds later, the visitors were back in front. Robinson's cross was met by Haley's layoff and Elizabeth Turland's superb volley. That wasn't the end of the drama, however, as Sophie Bagley made a crucial save from Rantela with seconds remaining to secure Brighton all three points.
we obviously concede two goals, but we, we always feel like we've got goals in us. Um, you know, and uh, fortunately we, we managed to we managed to, <laughs> to managed to score three today, and, and that was enough to, to take all three points. So um, delighted for the players. Liverpool were unbeaten in their previous four Barclays WSL matches, so there was a sense of confidence heading into the Merseyside derby that they can make amends for their defeat to Everton earlier in the season. The stop-start nature of the game, however, made for a scrappy encounter, with little to cheer about until Lucy Hope struck the crossbar for the Toffees in the second half. Her teammate Justine van Havermat then stung the gloves of Rachel Laws with a fizzing effort. Liverpool rarely tested Courtney Brosnan in the Everton goal, but Kerry Holland went close in stoppage time with a dangerous run. The point shared in a largely uneventful derby. It's a frustrating afternoon. Um, you know, we've got a sold-out away allocation there, and uh, obviously disappointed we couldn't win. But if we can't win it, we need to make sure we get the point. It puts us a point above United now, so um, it's another step in the right direction. Well, the, the Merseyside derby was quite an edgy affair, wasn't it, Fern? Both sides had chances, but that point for Liverpool moves them up to fourth ahead of Manchester United. And for Matt Beard's side, their season's really pushing on now, isn't it? Yeah, I think they'll be happy with that today. I mean, obviously, they didn't get the win, but as you said, a point on the table. So I think they'll be happy with where they are and obviously how they're growing as a team. You know, they're, they're solidifying where they are, the position. And if they can get that fourth spot, it's a real positive point for them. And also for Everton, a point for them today takes them away from that relegation zone a little bit as well. So a point all round is probably a fair, fair result. It was deja vu for Spurs. They won by a goal to nil again. And just like last week, they scored it in the second minute. Yeah, they did. And I think, you know, we've seen them do well and score goals. And they're playing that, you know, the Robert Villaham way, as, as the Tottenham way, as they call it. And Bethany will be really happy to have got herself on the score sheet. First goal of the WSL goal of the season. And I think, you know, First half of the season, they're probably conceding far too many goals, but now, yeah, scoring early and keeping clean sheets, they'll be really pleased with that. Anita, I feel like we come to you every week about Bristol, and I apologise, but <laughs> in terms of where they're at, is it a done deal now that they're the team that are going to go down? Mathematically, I know it's not a done deal. Well, mathematically, no, and I think every game they're just going to be looking to be better than the last, and I think they showed a really dogged, uh, determined game plan against Man United, and, it, you know, they were in large parts of the game today and it was unfortunate not to be able to bridge that goal deficit and yeah I guess all they can do is keep believing that they can get some results. A great comeback for Brighton today and Elizabeth Turland on the school sheet once again she's been their standout star performer this season how impressed with her have you been? Yeah, I'm very impressed. She's had an inspired season. You know, she's already up on 12 goals. And I think for a club that's been in transition and a bit of a turbulent time in terms of having an interim manager, being able to get a result today, come back from behind um, and, and find that winning goal late in the game shows a team that, you know, is hopefully moving the right direction and building some momentum towards the end of the season. Well, let's take a look at the Barclays Women's Super League table with Chelsea and Manchester City neck and neck on 43 points. Arsenal remain in the Champions League spots, eight points clear of Liverpool, who have swapped places with Manchester United to go fourth. Brighton climb up to eighth and Bristol City remain six points adrift of West Ham. Well, now it's time for the latest from the Barclays Women's Championship. The River Weir Derby was the pick of the tides with an eight-goal thriller. Mary McAteer scored Sunderland's second and third of the afternoon to help the Black Cats push on in their fight for promotion to the Women's Super League. Beth Heppel scored an inch-perfect free kick to put in a bit of light into the Durham camp, but the Blues couldn't capitalise and took the short trip home empty-handed. Well, elsewhere, Crystal Palace slotted three past relegation battlers Watford. Birmingham City won 2-0 at home to the other team in the relegation zone, Lewis. Two late goals for London City Lionesses secured all three points against promotion hopeful Charlton. Fellow title challengers Southampton fell short away to Blackburn Rovers. That's after a Megan Hornby brace. And Sheffield United put five past Reading. Well, with the end of the championship season fast approaching, there are seven sides that mathematically can clinch the title. Sunderland and Crystal Palace peel slightly further away from the chasing pack. Birmingham City, Southampton and Charlton all tied on 33 points. Lewis and Watford, well, they remain in the relegation places. 
Kenilworth Road was the host of the FA Women's National League Cup final on Saturday afternoon. Hashtag United came from behind to stun Newcastle United with the only fully professional side in the third tier of women's football. Sammy Rowland's persistence paid off as she put it on, put it on a plate for Phoebe Williams to net the winner and get their hands on the trophy. And huge congratulations to them from everyone here, of course. Well, coming up on the BBC, men's international football continues and keeping with the theme of derbies, Scotland hosts Northern Ireland on Tuesday. Coverage starts at 7pm on BBC Three. And of course, all episodes of Women's Football Weekly are available on BBC Sounds with Ben Haynes and Ellen White. So, next weekend, League Cup final, first piece of silverware this season. Fern, for you, which way is it going to go? I think we spoke about it before, didn't we? I think for me, I'm, I'm going to go with Chelsea on this one, just for the form that they're in at the minute. Not for the first time tonight, Anita. Two of your former sides. <laughs> <laughs> Which, where are you netting your colours to the mast on this one? Well, I'm also going to say Chelsea. I just think they always find a way um, to find a, get a result and they're scoring a lot of goals. Well, look, that's all we've got time for. Anita Fern, thank you so much for your company, as always. Well, City hold their own in the title race and paint Manchester blue in the process. We'll see you next week. Bye for now. Manchester City have won it now.